Hey, we're going to begin a little bit differently this morning. Art Leslie is about to emerge uh, from the wings into our baptistry. Uh, he has been studying with uh, a young man named Ignacio Carrera, and he is ready to give his life to Christ in baptism this morning. Let me read you something real quick here from the book of Colossians. Paul says that in, in Jesus... You also were circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. We are about to witness an awesome thing, to begin our service in an awesome way, as our brother Art welcomes Ignacio into the kingdom of God through baptism. I'd like to introduce you to Ignacio. Uh, and this past summer, Ignacio said, hey, I want to align my life with God. You know, I want to be baptized. He's been with us for six years. So this has been a journey. And uh, while this journey kind of ends, another one begins for Ignacio, and we're just absolutely thrilled that God has allowed us to sit on the front row and to watch this happen. Ignacio's number, it's number 47 for us and our kids and adults that uh, God has used the center in the summer camp to introduce to God. So can't think of a better place for this to occur than at Twickenham because of all the support that you've given to these young people. So I have a question for Ignacio, he's ready to answer. Ignacio, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God? Yes, I do. Uh, with this confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Over all the earth, you reign on high every mountain stream every sunset sky but my one request lord my only aim is that you reign in me again lord reign in me reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour you are the lord of all i am so won't you reign in me again over every thought over every word may my life reflect the beauty of my lord because you mean more to me than any earthly thing so won't you reign in me again lord reign in me reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour you are the lord of all i am so won't you reign in me again lord reign in me reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour Good morning, welcome to Twickenham officially now, and I just wanted to tell you if what we just witnessed raises any questions for you, we would love to sit and talk with you about that, to look together at scripture to see what it teaches about baptism and coming to Christ and receiving his free grace that we can't earn or deserve, just a beautiful, beautiful scriptural thing that we just witnessed and. uh, Again, if you have questions, we'd love to talk with you about it. If you're a guest, thanks for being with us today. We are honored to have you. A lot of our folks are gone. A bunch of our kids are gone uh, on a retreat with our new youth ministers, Caleb and Ashley, and our interns, Blake and Bailey. And then a bunch of parents went down there too. So we're grateful for uh, all the support we're getting there, and we pray for a safe trip for them. But we're glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. 
There's a card on the seat in front of you, and you can fill that out. Any prayer requests, put that down. We'll be praying about those first thing in the morning. You put that in the collection plate when it passes in just a little bit. Uh, one of the passages that we're going to look at today mentions being rich in good deeds. And I got to thinking about that and about, I just sort of began watching this week to see how many good deeds were going on. And I just, I just want to mention four of them to you. Um, Monday or Tuesday night, I think it was Tuesday night, I was up here late working on the message for this morning, and I kept smelling this real strong, clean smell, so clean it kind of burned your nose. And I thought, maybe, what is that? I thought, well, maybe the children's wing is burning down and we'll get a new one, right? So, but that... <laughs> That wasn't it. I went down, I followed it and I went down there and, and Leanne and her husband Doug, Leanne uh, Herring and Doug were, were down in the, in the first floor of the children's wing waxing the floors 8.30 at night and we had to get a designated driver for them because of the strong, <laughs> the strong wax smell. Leanne does so much stuff. Doug helps her out. If you see her, just say, hey, Leanne, thank you. Wednesday night. Uh, we have uh, a, a lady that's been visiting with us now, a sister that's been visiting with us now for several weeks. Hey, there's Ignacio. Give him a hand. Woo-hoo! It's awesome. So we have a lady that's been visiting with us for a while now named Nora. And Wednesday night after our dinner in Devo, I noticed that while I was sitting there just talking, Nora was up picking up plates and taking them to the kitchen and, and cleaning up, just really jumping in there. And doing stuff. Right before that, on Wednesday night, I, I was kind of down and frustrated about something, and I saw Jean Jones, and I sat down with her. Jean Jones is one of our older members. She's, I, how old she is is none of my business or yours. And <laughs> I sat down with, she teaches our kids, and I, I just started talking to her, and people started coming in, and she, she had taught those people when they were little, and now she's teaching their kids. And she, all she could do was say how blessed she was and how thankful she was and what an encouraging person she was to me just when I was feeling kind of down. So there's just three things I saw right off the bat. And then there's one more I wanted to mention to you. On Wednesday nights, our Sunday morning teachers get together in a classroom and go over the lesson for the following Sunday, the coming Sunday. Lee Potts, one of our elders, is kind of leading them through, getting them ready for teaching. There are so many people who are doing so many good deeds around here. It's just awesome. God is working through you. And that's, that, that's just one, that's just two days of observation of stuff that was going on. We're blessed to have a God that calls us into ministry and lets us be co-workers with him. We're going to have a great day today. Would you stand? We're going to sing and praise the Lord and just be glad that we're here. Thanks for coming. No eye has seen, and no ear has heard, and no mind has ever conceived the glorious things that you have prepared for everyone who has believed. You brought us here, and you called us your own.
Proverbs 30. Two things I ask of you, Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. I am not my own. I give up control. You can take me boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. Let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say I am rich, let the blind say I can see, it's what the Lord has done in me. Let the weak say I am strong, let the
Good morning. For those of you who are visitors, we thank you for being here. We're glad you're here. Uh, this is the time in our service where we are, turn our focus towards uh, Jesus' words and actions during the Last Supper and as he made the ultimate sacrifice on a cross. Recently, Jody has uh, shared and continues today on a series on money and wealth and riches, and uh, he's offered some really important questions and insightful perspective and I'd like for us to continually consider those. Uh, keeping with this theme, um, for today's communion thoughts, I, I thought we could just continue our thoughts and meditation on God's lavish generosity. Allow me to read from God's word, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes... For our sakes, he became poor, so that by his poverty, we might be rich. You see, before Jesus died on the cross, we were sinners for eternity and had no hope for eternity. We were, in essence, spiritually bankrupt, no chance of paying our spiritual debts. But God... Those two words, but God, in his infinite love, wisdom, and power, he graciously provided us his son, Jesus, a perfect, spotless, sinless sacrifice that we might have hope and move from spiritual poverty, bankruptcy, if you will, to spiritual riches and abundance and freedom. Because of Jesus and the free gift of salvation that comes from his death on the cross, we go from having a debt we could never pay to having an inheritance beyond our imagination. Would you join me in prayer? Dear Father God in heaven, we thank you so much. We were spiritually bankrupt, hopeless, having no plan B, and you provided us a perfect solution for all of eternity. You generously and graciously gave us your son, and by simply believing that he is your son, Jesus, he becomes our savior. We thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice. We thank you for this bread that we're taking now in remembrance of him. And finally, Father, we humbly ask that you would forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus Christ, His Son, give thanks with a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One, give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ. to be thankful for. As Jesus died on the cross, was buried in the tomb for three days, overcoming Satan and death, he rose on the third day, and that's good news, good news worth sharing. He eventually ascended and left behind for us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our counselor our advocate, and he intercedes or prays to God on our behalf continually. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul tells us that we're to let the Holy Spirit guide us, guide our lives rather than our sinful nature. Paul also tells us that these two forces, the Holy Spirit and our sinful nature, are continually battling each other. When we're directed by the Holy Spirit, we can and do have an abundant, rich life. Not only on earth, but for all eternity. A spirit-led, spirit-filled life produces the kind of fruit that is as perfect to have as it is to share. This spiritual fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. This fruit that I speak of is not necessarily financial, but I think we all know that it is worth more money, worth more value than any money. This fruit is our rich spiritual blessing. Let's go to God in prayer again. God, the creator of all the world, all the universe, we come to you and just simply ask that you would clean us, that we would be right in your sight, and that we would be obedient out of gratitude, that we would have hearts of obedience, and that our actions would shine for you. Thank you for your son. In his name we pray. Amen.
You revive me. You revive me, Lord. And all my deserts are rivers of joy. You are the treasure I could not afford. So I spend myself. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be your name, blessed be the
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. doesn't sound right, does it? It's not what the televangelists and slick-talking preachers have been trying to sell you. It doesn't even line up with the American dream, but it's true. God doesn't want you to be rich. Everyone wants to have a lot of money and to be comfortable, and they assume that God wants it for them too. He doesn't. If he did, he wouldn't have said it will be harder for the rich to enter heaven than a camel to pass through the eye of the needle. God didn't want his own son to be rich. Why would he want you to be? The poor and struggling have always been more receptive to God's message because they need God more intensely than those that have their needs met with their own money. And that's what God wants for us, to need him, to seek him, to cry out to him and follow him. God doesn't want you to be rich. In fact, he might want you to be poorer. Well, welcome to church. <laughs> I think we're done here, right? <laughs> Jeez. One of my all-time favorite philosopher theologians is Don Henley of the Eagles. And I can't tell you that I always agree with his politics. In fact, I'm quite confident that I don't agree with any of his politics. And I'm certain that I don't agree with all of his theology. But I really like the way he uses language. And I appreciate his cultural observations. And if we get to choose a voice when we go to heaven, I want his that or Celine Dion's, either one, doesn't matter. <laughs> in 1989, Don Henley released his third solo album, Into the Innocence, and one of the songs on that album that did not get a lot of airplay, but is a really great song, was called Gimme What You Got. It's a stunningly prophetic critique of what was then the coming decades, the 1990s, or as sociologists call it, the decade of greed. And when you hear the lyrics, you'll see that they're just as relevant today as they were back then. Baby picks off your plate, yours looks better, throws hers on the floor. Here in the home of the brave and the land of the free, the first word baby learns is more. It's interesting, the very next year in 1990, Vera Williams published her Caldecott award-winning children's book, more, 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 said the baby, which we read to our kids, and maybe some of you read to your kids, maybe you still do. I don't know if Mrs. Williams was a Don Henley fan, but I just think it's inter an interesting correspondence. Anyway, uh, one of the best lines in Give Me What You Got is this one, you cross a lawyer with the godfather, baby, he'll make you an offer you can't understand. <laughs> okay, obviously I thought that was a lot funnier than a lot of you did, so. The part of the song that sounds like it was written just last week, though, is this. From Main Street to Wall Street to Washington, from men to women to men, it's a nation of noses pressed up against the glass. They've seen it on the TV, and they want it pretty fast. You spend your whole life just piling it up there. You got stacks and stacks and stacks. And then Gabriel taps you on the shoulder, but you don't see no hearses with luggage racks. We're in the middle of a series right now, Right on the Money, and we're talking about me, you, our stuff, and God, and they all have something to do with each other. And what we've noticed so far is that Jesus had a lot to say about possessions, my stuff and yours, and the money we use to buy it. In fact, Jesus said more about money and possessions than he did sexual morality. 
Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about how, um, about getting a healthy perspective on our possessions. We can use them like pieces on a game board. We can live life like it's that awful board game monopoly, accumulating as much as we can, uh, or we can see that our possessions are assets that God lets us manage, and we can use those to bless other people. Last week, we talked about one of the dangers of money and possessions, and, and that is that they can deceive us into thinking that we don't need God any longer. And what, what we're really beginning to learn here is that Don Henley was not the first to critique a lifestyle of uncritical consumption. He did it 30 years ago. The Bible was doing it 4,000 years ago. We're not going to go quite, back, quite that far back this, this week. We're only going to go back 2,000 years. So I want you to look in the little book of First Timothy. First Timothy. It's toward the end of the Bible. It might be easier to back up, uh, to start in the back at Revelation and, and go toward the front about 11 books. Uh, First Timothy. Um, the book uh, was written to a young minister named Timothy. The letter was written to a young minister named Timothy. It was written by the Apostle Paul. You may have heard of him. And he sent this letter to Timothy to encourage him in his ministry and to teach him what he needed to teach to the people in the city where he was living. The city was Ephesus. It was a very wealthy, a very wicked city. And Paul is giving Timothy some instruction here uh, about how to prepare the church in that city to live like Jesus in that city. And the, now the section that we're going to look at uh, this morning sounds like it's the inspiration for Don Henley's song, but there's a difference. Just about the only thing artists and philosophers and pundits and even preachers can do is critique the culture. The Bible does that, but it also provides an alternative to the dominant ways of living. It's not enough to say, this isn't working very well. Everybody knows that. Everybody agrees that this isn't working very well. The, the evidence that we have been living a losing lifestyle has been presented, the verdict is in, and we're guilty. We need somebody to tell us what will work. And Paul does that in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He addresses two groups of people here. And I will guarantee you that you will find yourself in one of these two groups. Now, the thing is, you may not be in the group you think you're in. Okay? We'll see how we end up. The first group is, is the first group of people that Paul addresses are people who have the basic necessities of life covered. They're, they're not rich by any stretch of the imagination, but they aren't living on the street either. So let's listen to what Paul has to say to these folks. We're in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I'll begin in verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, I bet you notice something familiar there, the love of money part. We, we read that from the New International Version, and that's a really excellent translation of the original language. And I want, to, want you to notice two things about, about that. First, Paul says that it is the love of money that is a root of all kinds of evil, not money itself. A lot of people misquote that. You'll hear it on the TV or, or in songs or, or in movies or whatever. Money is the root of all evil. That's not what Scripture teaches. It's the love of money. The second thing I want you to notice, the way, especially the way the NIV translates this, is it says that the love of money is a root not the root. And that's exactly how it is in the original language. A root of all kinds of evil. Evil springs from as many different motivations as there are people. I mean, it, it can grow out of a love of power and probably does much of the time, most of the time. Evil can grow out of a love of pleasure. E evil can grow out of a love of popularity or a love of comfort or control or cruelty. Some of the evil in the world 
grows out of a love for money, but not all of it. Remember that scene in one of the Batman movies? I don't remember which one it was now. It was one of the better ones because there have been some really bad ones. When Bruce Wayne is trying to figure out why people are doing bad things and, and, and his faithful butler, Albert, says some men just want to watch the world burn. Sometimes evil just grows out of nothing but somebody who's just got an evil heart. Verse 8, though, I want you to look at verse 8 because Paul says something that sounds completely disconnected from reality. In fact, not very many of us, and I mean this room right here, not very many of us believe verse 8. Even if you believe the Bible is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God, even if you grew up in church, going to church all your life, even if you read the Bible every single day, Verse 8 may be the hardest verse in the Bible to read. If we have food and clothing, we will be content. Here's what he's saying. If you have the basics covered, food, shelter, and clothing, you have everything you need to be rich. And we're like, no. See, the concept of rich in Paul's economy doesn't mean the same thing as it usually does in ours. So really the question that verse 8 is asking is, which rich do you want to be? And I I think I know what I struggle with, and I I bet it's the same thing you struggle with. I like the other rich, the the one that Paul's not talking about. Rich to us, and you know, what what does that mean, right? What does it mean to be rich? Rich is anybody who has more than you. You're not rich. But anybody that has more than you is rich. It's kind of like greed. I'm never greedy, but people who have more than me are greedy. Very few people think they've achieved rich. In the Bible, though, rich is different. It means living a profitable life. It means, it means living a satisfying life. It means a life of joy and contentment regardless of your circumstances. So how in the world does, how in the world does Paul make that math work? Look at his equation. It's in verse 6. Here's here's Paul's equation for the kind of wealth the Bible is talking about. Godliness plus contentment equals great gain. Godliness is orienting your life toward God. Godliness means living your life God's way. It means doing your best to live by God's priorities, and he only has two. Somebody asked Jesus one time, what's the most important thing? What are the most important rules? What's the most important thing to God? What are God's priorities? He said, there are two of them. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor is yourself. Love God, love people. Those are God's priorities. That's what godliness means. Contentment, this is really cool. It's not not original with me, okay? This is really cool. Contentment is when your desires never exceed your resources. Your desires never exceed your resources. The sum of godliness, living God's priorities, and contentment, keeping your desires below your resources, is a rich, satisfying, profitable life. So how do we get contentment? Philippians chapter 4, verse 12, Paul said that, this is what Paul said about contentment. He said, and I hate this, he said, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. In other words, contentment is a state of existence that does does not come naturally to you and me. It has to be learned. Contentment has to be learned. Remember, Don Henley knew this, and he lives in California, Okay. The first word baby learns is more. We have to learn the word less, too. Now, if if you struggle with being content, and I'm just going to tell you right now, I confessed last week, the boat, I really want a boat. If you struggle with contentment like I do, I have some news. You can decide whether this is good news or not. Your struggle, mine, about this idea of contentment, is not new, and you're not the only one. You're not crazy. In the 1600s, 1600s, 400 years ago, 
an English Puritan preacher named Jeremiah Burroughs wrote a whole book called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. It's notable that he used the word rare. Do you know how things were in the 1600s? They were awful. And even then, people were struggling with contentment. So Burroughs says in his book, early in the book, he says that people typically try to achieve contentment. You do this and so do I, okay? This is so not new. He said that we try to achieve contentment by addition. I I, I try to to add add things to my life in order to be content. If I have possessions, I want to add more of them. Or if I don't have them, I want to acquire acquire what I do not have. And if I can either add to what I already have or, or acquire things that I don't have, then I'll be content. That's how we normally do it. Here's what Burroughs says. He says, contentment does not come in that way. It does not come, I say, by adding to what you want, but by subtracting from your desires. It is all one to a Christian whether I get up to what I would have or get my desires down to what I have already obtained. My wealth is the same. For it is as fitting for me to bring my desire down to my circumstances as it is to raise my circumstances to my desire. That's 400 years old. And it is so what I need to hear. It's hard to believe though, isn't it? It's really hard to believe that godliness plus contentment equals a rich, satisfying life. I mean, if you're in the group that's get just basic, got your basic needs met, you're not rich. Okay, you're, just, you're in group number one, you get your basic needs met. It's just hard to believe that. Why, but, but, but why does that math work? Look at verse 7. Paul says, we brought nothing into this world, we'll take nothing out of it. The, the Old Testament character Job put it this way, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall depart. John Stott, another great philosopher, theologian, said, our life on earth is a brief pilgrimage between two moments of nakedness. Entry and exit are exactly the same. Babies are not born with backpacks. Hearses don't pull U-holes. The reason godliness combined with keeping your desires within your means works is because life is not about how high your stack of stuff is. God does not want you to be rich despite everything you've heard from American culture, Despite everything you've heard from prosperity preachers, that is not God's will for your life in all likelihood. Paul is telling people who do not have a lot of stuff that they already have all they need to be truly rich. But then he gives us this warning. Look at verse 9. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation, into trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction because the love of money is the root of is a root of all kinds of evil some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs okay so maybe verse 8 is not the hardest verse to believe it's these verses the ones that warn us about how dangerous the desire to be wealthy is. We read these verses and we think, okay, Paul said some people who wanted to be rich wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Not all, just some. I could handle it, right? Do you think, are you like me? Do you think that? I could handle it. My mom and I have a joke about the lottery. They have the lottery in Georgia. We, we have a joke about the lottery that if she wins the lottery, we'll we'll handle it. We'll be the people that don't wind up ruining their lives. And I always tell mom, you know, if, if, I won, if you win the lottery and you give me a lot of money, Twickenham will not have to pay me another dime. You'll have to pay some other preacher, but you won't have to pay me, right? Because so, I can handle it. I can handle it. There's another writer in the Bible named James. He asks a really good question in chapter 4 of his book. He says, what causes the fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You think about your own 
struggles in your marriage, your extended family, your job, when there is division and quarreling, don't they come from your desires? Zach Eswin, I've quoted this guy before uh, in, a, in a book called The Imperfect Pastor, writes about the danger of desire for pastors who want to be famous, which is a different kind of rich. Okay, you have fame is just a, a, a different, a rich in a different economy. Eswin writes, uh, it's, it's just as relevant for, for this conversation. He says, make no mistake, desire is a firework handled wisely. It fills the night sky with light and color and beauty and delight. Handle desire poorly, and it'll burn your neighborhood down. It'll burn your neighborhood down. Desire for wealth will burn your family down. There's a famous line from the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? That perfectly summarizes what Paul is saying here. Do not seek the treasure. Do not seek the treasure. It'll kill you. It will kill you. Those are, those are Paul's words to folks who have the basic necessities of life covered. Live life God's way. Keep your desires within your resources. That equals a rich, satisfying life. But what if you're not in that group? What if you really are rich by our culture's definition? Now, my guess is that a lot of us thought, okay, I'm in that first group. I'm not rich. I'm just in that first group. You, no, you're not. No, no, no. Most of the people in this room are not in that first group. We're in this next group. We're, we're, we're the rich. By, not just by the world standards. We're, we're rich by the nation's standards. Shoot. We're rich by Huntsville standards. Okay, so what's God's word to us? If, we're in that, if we really are in that rich group, what's God's word to us? Not, not just people who've got the basics covered, but we've got the basic coverage plus we've got some abundance here. Look at verses 17 through 19, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Command those who are rich in this present world. This is not a suggestion this is not, uh, you know, an option. Paul says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them, there's that word again, command them to do good to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share in this way by not putting their hope in things, but putting their hope in God by being rich in good deeds and being generous and doing good and being willing to share. In this way, they will lay up for themselves a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So you'll really be rich. The first thing I want you to notice here is that what, what's not in this passage, okay, I, and I think this is important, there's no criticism for the rich here. There's no polemic against the rich here. Okay, that's pretty popular these days. In fact, there's more criticism aimed at the rich on a Don Henley CD than there is in these verses, which is pretty ironic because Don was way, way richer than Paul, all right? Paul's equation for people who only had the basics covered was godliness plus contentment equals great, great gain. Here's his equation for wealthy folks. Humility plus dependence on God plus generosity equals true life. Humility plus dependence on God plus generosity equals true life. Verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. If you have a lot of stuff, don't look down on people who don't. Don't be a jerk. I have a friend who is what we would call very well resourced. He's extremely well resourced. He, he's richer than you. 
In fact, you could take a whole bunch of us and put us together, and he would be richer than a bunch of us. Now, he's probably not richer than all of us, but he's richer than a lot of us. His neighbor has a helicopter pad in the backyard, okay? He doesn't have a helicopter pad, but he does have an airplane that he flies around in. I mean, his own personal airplane and a pilot that he, he is just really well resourced. You know who some of his best friends are? Some of the people from the first group that only have the basics covered. I mean, they, he, he has a bunch of friends. Most of his friends are people from the first group. And the reason he can be friends with them is because of humility. He's just a really humble guy. You, you, if you, I, I, I complimented him on a pair of tennis shoes he was wearing one day. And I looked at him, I thought, those are probably from France or something. They just look real, not from around here, like real European kind of, I thought, I bet those, and I said, those are really neat tennis shoes. He said, I got those at Dollar General. <laughs> those are, they're so comfortable. I was at, uh, years ago, I, was, I went to Goodwill to buy costumes for the kids, Halloween costumes for the kids. It was like October and I, I was trying to put together a pirate outfit, you know, pro tip here, young parents, Goodwill or the His Way uh, thrift store, you can, all kind of neat stuff, you don't have to spend a whole lot on it. So I was in there putting together a couple of pirate outfits for the boys for Halloween trick-or-treating, and I saw his wife in there, and she saw me, and I went, oh, God. So I was like, I'm only here because I'm putting together Halloween costumes for the boys. I don't shop here. This is, ha, 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 I'm just putting together Halloween costumes for the boys. And she went, that's nice. Look at these pajamas I found for my grandchildren, only 50 cents. She was really proud of the fact that she was shopping at Goodwill. They were just really humble kind of folks. That's what Paul's talking about here. If you're well-resourced, if you're in this second group, humility. And and if you're rich, Paul says, don't put your hope in wealth. Put your hope in God. Depend on God. If it depreciates, if it wears out, if it can be lost, stolen, or destroyed, it is not a safe place to invest your hope. It is not a safe foundation on which to build your life. Build your life on God. Then he says, be generous. Do good. Be rich in good deeds. Be willing to share. Our possessions are not really ours. They're God's assets. We are not the owners of those assets. We are God's asset managers. If you want to, if you want to really be rich, use those assets for his purposes to build his kingdom to care for his people. Humility plus dependence on God plus generosity equals true life. You know, when I, when I stand back and, and, and look at all of these verses here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, you, you know what I conclude? Money is not the problem. Neither the lack of it nor the abundance of it. Money's not the problem. We are. How we think about it, what we do with it, that's, that's where the problem arises. Let, let me show you one more thing and we're done. And this, this kind of teaching is scattered all over the Bible. We started with some lyrics this morning. I want to end with a poem slash prayer from Proverbs chapter 30. We heard this a minute ago. I just want you to hear it again. Two things I ask of you, Lord, do not refuse me before I die. It's kind of bold, isn't it? Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. But give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Folks, let's have a, let's have a week this week where we recognize how blessed we are. Stay humble about it, depend on God, and use everything God has given us to be a blessing to somebody else. In other words, let's just let the Lord reign in us this week. Can we do that? Let's stand. Let's sing. Lord, reign in me. Reign in your power over all my dreams. 
In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I have. So won't you reign in me again over every thought, over every word. May my life reflect the beauty of my Lord. Could you mean more to me than any earthly thing? So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me. Reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me. Reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me. Reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again. Hey, don't forget these things this week. It is our last Children's Ministry Terrific Tuesday. This Tuesday, going to Green Mountain for a picnic and lunch up there at 10 a.m. This is also our last dinner and a Devo this Wednesday night. Is school about to start or something? I don't have one going back this year. Well, they're going, but not around here. Um, I don't even know when school starts anymore. This is our last week for dinner and a Devo, barbecue sandwiches. Uh, Cade Smith will be speaking. But I do want you to remember that we have kind of continued that in that we have decided to put, for the month of August only, the spring and dinner and evil kind of together, and we're calling it midweek spring and dessert. So we'll have dessert at 6.15, and then our instrumental worship at 6.30, and uh, there'll also be a, a textual class for those who prefer that. So keep those things um, in mind this week. Really glad that you were here, and you, we hope you have a great week. Let's pray as we close. God, thank you for all that you blessed us with, and we pray that uh, you would reign in us this week, reign in our lives, and may we, as, as needed and where we can, show you to other people. Bless us, thank you for this time together, and as always for Jesus, in his name we pray, and all the degrees say, amen. Have a great day.